Well, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to Preach and Pray, the first of the new year. I do hope that you uh, were able to enjoy a bit of a break over the last uh, few weeks and that you're feeling refreshed and ready for the year ahead. Uh, a year which, of course, uh, promises to be quite challenging. Life remains difficult, I think, but still a year full of opportunity for us to experience God's faithfulness and to share his love and his truth with other people. For me, at the start of this new year, I know there's something that I need to hear again and again, and that is that God is sovereign, that he is in charge, uh, that there is a throne at the heart of the universe and it's not empty. God is on it. He's not lost the plot. He's still in charge. And uh, that's the reality that stares at us, that jumps out at us, uh, jumps out at us as we read the psalm that we have before us today, Psalm 72. So let's read it together now. Psalm 72. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him with gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him, for he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given to him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May corn abound throughout the land. On the tops of the hills may it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvellous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and Amen. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father, we praise you for your sovereignty in our lives and in our world. And we praise you for the good news that your son, our saviour Jesus, was born at the first Christmas. And that in him your kingdom has come. Your plan of salvation is continuing to be outworked. And we praise you that one day we know he will return in all his glory to restore and renew all things. So please speak to us through this great passage today and use it to fix our eyes on Jesus, the reigning King, and to align our lives with the power, the glory and the priorities of his kingdom. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together and uh, because we're all in our homes, we can sing out and enjoy praising God together. I suggest that you turn up the volume and that you stand and Enjoy singing your hearts out. This is uh, perhaps our last opportunity to sing along with one of the Christmas videos that our musicians made for us. So we're going to sing at the reign of King Jesus in the song King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting 
without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, Spirit one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom coming And to reconcile the lost To redeem the whole creation You did not despise the cross For even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus, for our sake you died And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who gone, to the Father are restored the church of Christ was born And then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not kneel, shall not praise By His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me Well, I hope you uh, really enjoyed singing that song. I think New Year always gives us a good opportunity, doesn't it, to just pause and reflect on the priorities of our lives and the direction 
at which they are taking. I remember once hearing about a proud Englishman boasting that he was born an Englishman and would die an Englishman. His words were overheard by a Scottish man who was passing by and retorted, Good heavens, man, have you no ambition? I think that sounded more Welsh than Scottish, but never mind. I wonder, what's your ambition for 2020? Of course, some of us uh, don't regard ourselves as particularly ambitious. We're more the anything for a quiet life type of person. But of course, that doesn't mean we have no ambition. It just means that our ambition is to avoid trouble and to avoid taking anything too seriously, except perhaps our ambition not to take things too seriously, for which we'll do pretty much anything. I'm also aware that some of us perhaps are ambitious, but don't have such a healthy relationship with ambition. We're the always on the go type who can hardly sit still for five minutes. We are children of FOMO, fear of missing out, one of the uh, diseases perhaps of our generation. Our ambition, well, it's effectively never to be bored. But whether or not we see ourselves as ambitious, the reality is that all of us live for something, even if it's just for the unnoticed quiet life, but that's still a kind of ambition. The question is not whether we have ambition, but whether the things that we live for are really worthy of being lived for, whether they can bear the weight that we are putting on them. So here's a question for us at the start of 2020. Is there actually anything which is so worth living for that it's also worth dying for? Is there anything of supreme and unparalleled and irreplaceable value? Well, of course, according to Jesus, the answer is yes, there is. Matthew 13, verse 45 and 6, he says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and brought it. The pearl of supreme value is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. They're the same thing. In other words, the reality of God stepping in to take charge and to put things right. That's the kingdom. So what does it really look like to, to long for the impact and advance of this kingdom? What is that kingdom in a little more depth? Well, Psalm 72 gives us a great way to explore that question. It's originally a prayer for an ancient king in Israel and for his reign. The title that we have in our Bibles of Solomon uh, may mean that it was written by Solomon, of course, one of Israel's most famous kings, or possibly that it was written about Solomon perhaps even by his father, King David, perhaps verse 20 would suggest that. Either way, this is a prayer, a psalm of, of deep ambition. Just cast your eye over verses 2 to 11 and how pretty much each of them begins with that word may. May, this is an expression of longing, of drive, of ambition for God and his kingdom. It's a very special prayer, an ancient one, but a prayer birthed by the Holy Spirit in the heart of an ancient writer, articulating a vision of a reign which went far beyond anything Solomon would ever experience. It's a vision of the ultimate kingdom of God, the inbreaking reign of God, a vision which will find its true fulfillment only in the reign of King Jesus. Like many Psalms, this Psalm seems to me to be structured in in those kind of parallel layers, which the scholars often refer to as, as a chiasm, almost like cutting a cross section through an onion and seeing the different layers going out from the center. And generally it's agreed that when a psalm is, uh, is structured that way, it focuses our attention into the middle, the central section of the psalm, where the emphasis lies. Let's just walk through it briefly. First of all, in verses one to four, we see the initial focus is on the king of Israel and his reign of justice and righteousness. Verse one and two, endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness, 
May he judge your people in righteousness and your afflicted ones with justice. Notice the repetition, righteousness and justice, righteousness and justice. That's the kind of king God wants in charge of his people because God himself loves righteousness and justice. And the result of this reign of righteousness and justice will be prosperity for the people because good government blesses the people, verse 3. And justice means rescue for the oppressed, verse 4, deliverance. So there's the initial focus, the king of Israel and his reign of justice and righteousness. But then in verses 5 to 7, the next focus, still on the king of Israel, is now on the lasting blessing of his reign. The lasting blessing of his reign. Verse 5. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. I wonder how often you found yourself thinking of a current serving prime minister and thinking, wow, it's so good when they are in charge. I really wish that their rule would just go on forever and ever. I can't think of many times when I've thought that in the course of my life, I have to say. But but when God's ideal king is reigning, yes, people want it to go on forever. May he endure as long as the sun, they cry. Because the reign of God's king brings amazing blessing to those over whom he reigns. Verse 6, may he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound until the moon is no more. What a great picture of what it is to live under the reign of God's chosen king. A picture of lasting blessing. But of course, King Jesus has risen from death. He has broken death's power. He lives forever. And so through him, the lasting blessing of God's reign comes into our lives and rests on us forever, which is wonderful. No earthly king could ever bring this lasting blessing because even if they rule well, soon they die. But not so with King Jesus. His eternal reign brings everlasting blessing. Well, so far the focus has been on Israel, but now there's an even bigger picture which begins to open up. Verses 8 to 14, which is the central section and therefore the key section of the psalm. The king of Israel, it tells us, will reign not just over Israel, but over the nations. And through that reign, the poor will be lifted. Verses 8 to 14. Let's just look at verse 8. May he rule from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. This is extraordinary. It's talking about Israel's king and praying that he will rule to the ends of the earth. It's as if this ancient prayer has suddenly burst its banks and is now flowing out from Israel with blessing to the whole world. Verse 9, may the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. I love that image of the desert tribes bowing before him. A number of years ago when I was in Australia, I met a guy for whom this verse had become the passion of his life. The desert tribes bowing before the king that God appoints, King Jesus. And uh, he gave his life to pursue this among the desert tribes of North Africa, predominantly uh, Islamic people. And it was great when I was last in Australia to meet two other couples who, encouraged by the, the first man's vision, have gone to, to, to work in North Africa in pursuit of the same vision, wanting these desert tribes to bow the knee to King Jesus. I just love that, that drive for Jesus and his kingdom. And, and that drive, that ambition is very much the heartbeat of this psalm. Continues, verse 10. May the kings of Tarsh Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. Tarshish is probably southern Spain. Middle of verse 10. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him with gifts. Uh, Sheba is probably Saudi Arabia and Seba North Africa, but all of them are included within this amazing kingdom that God is establishing. And then just in case any part of the world is missing, verse 11 is all encompassing. May all kings bow before him and all nations serve him. All kings, 
all nations. I think in recent years uh, within Above Bar, many of us have, have gained a real vision for working out the mission of God right where we are in Southampton, reaching out to people with the truth and the love of Jesus. And I think that's absolutely right. I, I'm totally behind it. I think it's inescapable that we have this primary responsibility to pursue the mission of God in the place where he has located us. And we need to be willing to invest our time and our resources as a church into that with real energy and driving ambition. We want our city to, to see the love of Jesus and to hear about that love. But at the same time, we mustn't lose the, the global ambition of this psalm. Remember, the longing for all the nations to serve him. There is so much still to do in the cause of global mission, as well as much to pursue in our local mission. Saudi Arabia, mentioned here, is less than 0.3% evangelical Christian. In most of North Africa, only tiny fragments of the Christian church exist today. In swathes of the Middle East, the good news of Jesus is virtually unknown. And even in Western Europe today, even the basic gospel events are largely unknown by a rising generation. And that, of course, is a huge challenge and a great opportunity as well. It's an opportunity because many have not rejected the gospel because they heard it and decided it was lacking, but simply because they don't know. And that gives us a kind of blank canvas to paint on, a fresh opportunity to present the claims of Christ and the good news of the gospel. And our call, therefore, within Western Europe is to redouble our efforts and to, to flex our methods in order to, to meet this challenge so that our continent hears as well as all the continents. So let's resolve at the start of 2021 to tune in both to the global and to the local ambition of this psalm, to make it our own and to invest our prayers, our lives, our resources in seeing it fulfilled. But I want you to notice something very wonderful and very important here. There's a question. Why will the nations bow before God's king? Why will they? What will win them? And the answer is not conquest or coer coercion, not domination or power. Have a look at verse 12. Begins with that key word, for or because. In other words, this is what explains why the kings of the world and the nations of the world will bow before him. It will be because he will deliver the needy who cry out the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. To quote Alec Matia, the kings and nations are won by the quality of mercy in the king. You got that? The kings and nations are won by the quality of mercy in the king. Isn't that beautiful? And did you notice at the end of verse 14, precious is their blood in his sight. He's talking about those subject to oppression and violence and saying precious is their blood in the sight of God. I wonder if you remember the story of Alan Kurdi, the three-year-old Syrian lad whose dead body was washed, was washed up on a Turkish beach in 2015 while he and his family were trying to escape the troubles in their homeland and flee to Greece. Of course, to those fighting for power in Syria, this was, quite frankly, a price that was worth paying. But not to God. Precious was his blood in God's sight. Sometimes we hear of one of our big breakfast friends dying on the streets, leaving behind a society that barely notices that they've gone and that doesn't mourn the loss. But God does. Precious is their blood in his sight. The nations are won by the quality of mercy in the king. This is the beautiful, radical, countercultural, unexpected heart of the kingdom of God and of its king, our Lord Jesus. Don't you just love that? I do. And nothing, of course, has changed. 
our task as those who want to work for the kingdom of God is still to proclaim the reign of the king and to call the people of our city and of the nations to bow before him and to love and trust and obey him. And it is still the quality of his mercy that will win them. We must never forget that. They won't be won by the slickness of our campaigns. They won't be won even by the persuasiveness of our arguments, ultimately. They won't certainly be won by our pressurising them into responding. No, they'll be won when they see the quality of mercy in King Jesus, his kindness to the broken. To be persuasive, the gospel must be heard in compelling words and it must also be seen in practical love, in the pursuit of justice and compassion and practical care. That's why it's been so important that we have worked with others to, to step up to serve our city in its time of need during the uh, pandemic crisis. It's why alongside that, online alpha and online church and personal evangelism are so important and we mustn't neglect them. Both must work together, word and deed, like two blades of a scissor, cutting in order to bring the truth of the gospel to our society. In verses 15 to 17, the focus moves again slightly. The king of the nations and now his reign of lasting blessing. It echoes, of course, what we already saw in verses 5 to 7. But now it's not just blessing for Israel, it's blessing for the nations. Verse 17, may his name endure forever, may it continue as long as the sun, then all nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. This is wonderful, isn't it? It's, uh, of course, a, a, a vision of the fulfillment of God's great promise to Abraham back in Genesis 2, uh, Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3, that, that God would bless him and make him a blessing so that all of the nations of the world will be blessed through him. And this psalmist is picking up that promise and praying to God for its fulfillment, a fulfillment that would only ultimately come to fruition. When the risen Lord Jesus ascends to the Father and takes charge and his blessing permeates the nations through all generations through the preaching of his gospel, his reign of lasting blessing. And then the psalm finishes celebrating the wonderful deeds of God, whose glory will spill over from Israel and fill the nations. Verse 18, praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel who alone does marvellous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. What a fantastic vision of the kingdom of God. And when we see this vision, we understand, don't we, why Jesus, why Jesus described that kingdom as the pearl of great price, of supreme and ultimate value. And we understand why Jesus spoke so often of the good news of the kingdom, because it clearly is good news. When God steps in to reign, there is justice for the oppressed. Power is wielded with righteousness. The people are blessed and that blessing lasts. The guilty are forgiven. The weak are rescued. The poor are lifted. The nations are united and blessed. We see the answer to this ancient prayer in a way that the person who first prayed it could never have seen. Because the true and ultimate King, King Jesus, has come. That's what we've remembered in our Christmas celebrations. And through him, this saving reign of God has begun. And people from all the nations are bowing before him and coming into his blessing. They love and they worship him because of the quality of his mercy, because his blessing comes not to the strong who believe they can earn it, but to the weak who know how desperately they need it. And of course, that mercy was displayed supremely on the cross where Jesus died to pay the penalty for all our rebellion and our failure so that we could be forgiven and brought into his blessing, welcomed into his family, embraced by his love. And so people from all the nations bow before him and proclaim you are worthy because you were slain and with your blood you purchased people for God from every nation, tribe and language. 
the mission of our churches as we go into a new year is not to be religious clubs for insiders, but to be focused on proclaiming and living this good news of the kingdom in our city and across our world. It's true for all the churches of our city and nation. It's true specifically of our own church at Above Bar. We need to be clear in the message we proclaim without flinching, without distraction, without compromise. And we need to be clear in our responsibility to make the message of the King's mercy visible, compelling and credible by the mercy that we show to those around us who are in need. And that, my friends, is, I believe, what it looks like to live ambitiously for the Kingdom of God. So at the start of 2021, can I ask, is that how I am going to live? Is that how you are going to live ambitiously for the kingdom of God? I wonder if someone were able to view my bank statements for the coming year, would it be obvious to them that God's kingdom is my deepest longing and my prevailing ambition? Or if I employed a life coach to, to look over my diary and, and see how I use my time, would it be obvious from that investment of time that the kingdom of God is what matters to me most? Or if a visitor spent a week in our church to see it in action, would it be obvious to them that this is our shared longing, our shared ambition? And if God were to hold up a mirror to my prayer life, the things for which I, I pray most frequently, would it be obvious that the progress of the kingdom in the nations of the world is my driving ambition and the longing of my heart. This is going to be a challenging year for sure and the sovereign God is sufficient for the challenge but if we allow this great psalm to set the ambition of our hearts I believe it can also be a year of tremendous advance for the kingdom of God. Please God let it be so. Well, we're going to sing a great hymn celebrating the reign of Jesus, our great King. It's the hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. So please join in as we sing this together.
So let's pray together now. The nations will be won by the quality of mercy in the King. And as we worship before your cross, Lord Jesus, we want to say our hearts are one. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for you have died for me. Your praise shall never, never fail through all eternity. We receive and honour you as our King. We offer our lives to you and to the work of your great kingdom at the start of this year. Please help us, both individually and as a church, to make your mercy visible in our actions and to make it clear and compelling in our words. And please may we see a great harvest for Jesus and the gospel in the year ahead. Please strengthen us in our daily lives to live for Jesus and speak for Jesus so that many may be one for him. Please strengthen those who are working in a whole range of projects in our city to bring the hope and love of your kingdom into the lives who are finding life into the lives of those who are finding life particularly difficult at this time. And please, Lord, may many join us in our online Alpha course. And may we be faithful in praying and inviting friends to join us there. We want to pray today for all of our sent mission partners in their work to serve you here and across the world. We just name them before you one by one. Eddie and Sue Arthur, Adam and Kate Collett, Becca Taylor, Bex Hayes, Paul and Carol Yonson, Peter and Kate Nolson, Tony and Jane Watkins, Zilla Whitehouse, Matt and Joyce Wan, and Chris and Louise. Lord, we thank you for the time of rest many of us have been able to enjoy over this Christmas period and we pray for strength and energy as we face the challenges and opportunities of the new year. We pray especially for those for whom 2020 has been particularly difficult and we pray that you would comfort them and encourage them and give them fresh energy at the start of the year. We pray for our government facing the challenges of the coronavirus as well as the need to work out our new relationship with the European Union. Please give courage, humility, wisdom and a deep desire to heal the wounds of the past so that we can walk forwards in unity as a nation for the future. And may many in government, local and national, reach out to you for the wisdom which is beyond their own, we pray. And Lord, for all of us, please give us the courage and commitment that we need to make your kingdom our first ambition and our number one priority in the year ahead. We pray for Jesus' sake and in his name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for Preach and Pray. Uh, just to say there is no Zoom prayer this evening. But next week we will be joining with uh, Christians from other churches across the city at 7.30 for a citywide Zoom prayer. Really hope that you're able to join us for that. They've been some very special times. Now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. God bless you in the week ahead.